Hello and welcome to season four, episode 20 of Dualist Community. I am enjoying the ability to explore my curiosity. I've uh, gotten back into traveling a bit. Just got to LA a couple of days ago and interacting with more and more people and just been enjoying learning about people's experiences, what they've been through, what they're currently going through and just the back and forth that's involved with that, uh, not the least of which being today's conversation. Very excited to uh, to learn and explore whatever this conversation becomes. And I am not enjoying the process of application. I just wanted to make that very clear to everybody who knows me and everybody who's listened to me go through theory and metaphysical concept and philosophy and all that other fun stuff that at the end of the day, once you've had a chance to process all of that verbally and consciously and conceptually and whatnot, comes the application process, which is where the humility comes in, which is where everything falls out from underneath you. And it's not necessarily that it falls out from underneath you so much as you have gotten to the point where you're willing to just allow that to happen. So you can see the next lesson that you've been working so hard to get to that you can only find now through going through the fire. So it doesn't have to be pleasant. You don't have to enjoy it, but there is a rhyme and a reason to it so long as you just Keep it light, you'll get through, and it'll all make sense in your next moment of clarity. That all said, I am very excited about this episode. I do have one quick announcement, which is that we have another mini retreat coming up in August. In Vermont, August 24th to 28th, tickets are currently available to our Tier 3 Patreon supporters and will be for the next week. And then next Monday, it will, it will be available for Tier 2 if there are any tickets left. Uh, the last two events sold out within a day or two. So I would recommend if you are interested in coming, definitely join us on Patreon. We would love to see you. That's it for the announcements. Let's get to the episode. Today, we are joined by Amanita Dreamer. Now, she is a social media content creator. She has a very similar interest to Andrew and myself in terms of the conscious experience, the journey to recognizing you are here and now, forever and always will be, and that division is just a concept. She explores the role of different types of mushrooms and different types of uh, entheogens and drugs uh, in the same way that we do. I do have a number of questions for her as she is often talking about Amanita muscaria as well as psilocybin mushrooms and, and, and various other different substances. Amanita muscaria is actually not something I am overly familiar with outside of conversations that I've had with uh, native friends in the past and some of the research I've, I've done in my free time. I've never experimented with it, though I am very familiar with psilocybin. So I'm excited for this conversation, as well as to find out a little bit more about you, where you came from, how your path has developed, and uh, just to thank you for joining us here today. Hi. Howdy. Thank you for having me on. This is exciting. Yeah, super, super excited for this chat. So uh, in in my uh, research of you, being able to listen to some some stories you've told, things you've chatted about, you you talked about your initial experience with Amanita muscaria, basically coming out of state of depression. We're thinking about ending it all, leaving leaving this uh, this experience is, I I believe how you put it. And then you came across, happened to go on a walk in the woods, came across Amanita muscaria mushroom, basically changed your life. So I'd love to hear all about that experience, I guess, starting with what you were coming out of that experience that you had throughout your life, maybe some things that led to that state of a lot of anxiety, depression, um, what was involved in that experience and where you saw it coming from kind of leading up to your experience with Amanita muscaria that clearly changed your life. I know today it was undiagnosed autism. At the time, I thought that it was just coming out of Hurricane Katrina and the emotional and financial damage from that and then having to get put on benzodiazepines. But in truth, looking back, it was living with autism and not knowing it. And then just the whole gaslighting and then the masking and trying to cope with a society that I wasn't fitting into because I didn't know who I was. And that coupled with Hurricane Katrina and then the panic attacks and having to get on benzos, which was okay. I mean, it sucked. It wasn't a great way to live, but I needed it. And I was a good candidate and I don't fault my doctor for putting me on them. It gave me, you know, functionality again, but pretty quickly, like four or five years in, and I was getting early onset dementia and I wasn't functioning anymore. And I didn't want to be the butt of jokes and I didn't want my children 
to lose respect for me and then and become dependent on them and they were so young and i and i was missing their their lives and everything and it it's something i've always wanted to be was a good mother and i was willing to sacrifice anything to be a good mom this was taking away everything i wanted to be so when i started trying to get off of them um, because the medical community, they're like, oh, a couple of weeks, you'll be fine. Which, I mean, that just started a hell like no other. So I found that um, Ashton protocol and I started doing that. But I mean, I would get like down to a third of my dose and the pain was so awful. The nightmares and the zaps and the the horror that I was living in in my head with just panic that was far worse than anything that I even got on them for was just a hell on earth that anyone who's been through it knows that I'm not going to sit here and try to explain it because it's something you can't explain the sleep deprivation and the 24 hour pain and the the feeling like you're truly losing your mind. And then, you know, I would be in the middle of the grocery store talking myself through every step. You can do this. You can do this. They've got to eat. You can do this. And then just abandoning my cart and running for the door and then getting home and feeling shame because I can't feed my children. It was just <gasps> it's so awful. <laughs> and I tried that over and over and over for five more years to come off of them and all they would do is just throw more drugs at me, more support drugs that didn't help. They just made the problem worse. And finally, you know, five more years of that, a total of 10 years, it's like I couldn't live with them. I couldn't live without them. And either way, I was going to become a problem for my children and a burden on society while I'm miserable and I'm a highly intelligent person. And the facts of the matter show that it made no sense for anyone for me to stay. It was just a very matter of fact conclusion. It, it wasn't born of, oh, woe is me. Nobody likes me and this world's awful. It wasn't like that. It was, it was very matter of fact. It wasn't like I was depressed and felt hopeless. It was because it was a matter of fact decision. I wanted to be here and raise my children. I would have lived through depression to raise my children. It was the fact that I could not live on those drugs and I also wasn't functional off those drugs. So logically, it was a matter of fact decision that it made more sense to leave, not stay. I planned it out. I did everything according to the way my research told me I should do it to make sure that it was done in the most appropriate way that caused the least amount of trauma other than what was going to happen already. And then I, I set the date and I kid you not the day before I was going to leave, I woke up so relieved knowing this was my last 24 hours to live like this. And I sat on my back deck and I heard a voice that said, if you're going to leave the planet, you should come walk out here and, and see the planet that you're going to leave. It was very clear, crystal clear voice. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> and all of the drug-induced states that I had been in, all the pharmaceutical states and hell. I'd never heard a voice like that. It was, it was very profound, pulled me from my chest. I got up and I was like, okay, walk right out the back, right into the woods. And I don't know, 30 seconds into my walk, there's this brightly colored mushroom. And I was like, I'd lived here like five years on this um, land at that point and had never seen anything like it. I picked it. I came in the house. I looked it up. It was Amanita muscaria. I was like, oh, deadly toxic. Yeah, but it's beautiful. And what a beautiful gift from the earth to say goodbye with. And as I'm looking at it and I saw all of the art and literature and that it could possibly be in the Rig Veda and the story of Soma and all the religious iconography. And it's in South America and Incan culture and it's all over the planet. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is not what humans do to a substance that's deadly. This is what humans do to a substance that is to be revered. Something ain't right about this story. <laughs> so I went down this rabbit hole and I just kept looking. And then I looked into the pharmacology of it. I wanted to know what was so deadly about it. And that's when I found that muscimol, one of the actives in it, is a GABA agonist. The natural version of a benzodiazepine. And like, I felt like I had been punched in the chest. I was like, you, I said out loud, you have got to be kidding me. So then I looked up ibotenic acid, found out it's a cholinergic 
and hits the glutamate receptors. And the upside and then the calming side, it's a perfect balancer of the fight or flight system. The thing I had been searching for my whole life. And I just, I knew in that moment, I was like, this, could this really have been the voice of this mushroom that called? No. Okay. That's just ridiculous. No, but you know, let me go see if I can find some more just in case this is something I can really use. So I went to bed that night. I woke up the next day, leaving the planet was the furthest thing from my mind because I thought this could be my answer. That this, this could be it. Like this could keep me here. So I went driving and found them everywhere. <laughs> I just went harvesting them and drying them and, and set out to learn how to prepare them and, you know, figure this out. It took me two weeks to muster the courage to take it. I couldn't find any correct way to take it online. Nothing made sense. Everything was conflicting. So I said, okay, I talked to the mushroom. I said, well, if you're the one that told me to come find you, then you're going to tell me how to do this. So I set them out on the counter in the kitchen. And I said, how do I, how do I use you? How do I prepare you? And they said a cup of water, about 15 grams, 20 minutes ought to do it. Just heard it plain as day in my head. And I was like, okay, why not? You know, I, at this point, I mean, I felt like I was living like on this crazy borrowed time because technically I wasn't supposed to be here anymore. And I don't know if you've ever spoken to anyone who seriously planned to leave the planet and, and didn't tell anyone because they seriously wanted to leave and they didn't want to be stopped. Once you're in that position and you know, you're not going to stay when you wind up staying, you're different. You're, you're never the same again. And it's like this, it's free time now. It's like the rules be damned. I'm not even supposed to be here anyway. I can do whatever I want. If I'm hearing voices from a mushroom, cool. <laughs> and it, it, it was freeing in a way. It was beautiful. So I made it the way they told me to. And I sat there looking at it and I just took like tiny little sips, like a little bit at a time. I just waited to see if I was going to get sick. Took a little more, you know, after like an hour and a half, I didn't feel sick. Nothing bad happened. So I was like, well, I'm just going to get it over with. So I like chugged a bunch of it and I tripped. I woke up the next morning and I just cried because it's the first time in my life I didn't have anxiety. And I never knew that I had never lived without anxiety. And to, for the first time, not have that feeling in my body felt that the body feeling of just feeling free. There's just, I was like, if I can live like this, my God, like I want to stay for this. And you imagine the kind of life I could live, the things I could do, the kind of mother I could be. And, and the pain went away. The ruminating thoughts went away. I slept through the night. Just the joy. It, it was just like there's no words to describe the hell of coming off benzos. There are no words to describe the joy of coming out of your first real Amanita trip and waking up on the other side of it. That's really interesting. And it leads me actually to a question that I have in regards to the differences between psilocybin and Amanita muscaria, because as you mentioned, it's different psychoactive compounds. Uh, is it muscimol and ibutenic acid, um, which is not a neuroconductor as opposed to psilocybin, uh, which is a neuroconductor. So I, I would imagine that changes the, I guess, the type of experience entirely is it the cessation of of that default mode of that background noise or are you actually experiencing more in the way of insight from moment to moment um these are all neurotransmitters and and it is sort of like those of us that are doing this looking at it and talking to the researchers that are that are looking into it ava machacek is one of the leading researchers um looking into the components of this mushroom and we all sort of feel like there are that it hits dopamine because there's some precursor activity in there and some, some components of it that it may also be a dopaminergic. Um, the differences are, well, they're, there's not, they, they don't have anything alike. Um, they're both fungi and that's sort of like where it ends. The fact that they are fungi that are nootropic psychoactive, maybe like that's about all you could really say about them. 
Um, they're, they have different purposes in our psyche, in our brain, and then to the other side and the trip experience and then the mushroom voice experience that you bring back and then the entities that you see. All of those things are very, very different. But yes, the fact that they are psychoactive, nootropic, and they're both in mushroom packages, that's that's how they're similar. But then like psilocybin, you can grow on a substrate. But Amanita has to have this very complex uh, mycorrhizal relationship with the trees and the earth around it and these relationships. And it And it won't grow without that. So we can't grow them. That's very interesting because my, similar to Ray, my experience is only with psilocybin when it comes to psychoactive mushrooms. And I know from, from psilocybin, you know, when you take them, when, whether it's microdosing or a higher trip, it is impacting that default mode network, which is where people will say it's, it's like where your sense of self sort of is. So without so much idea of yourself, you're left with what is here and now, which is where so many of the benefits of psilocybin come in because there isn't so much a story that you're telling yourself anymore. And that story is where most of our suffering is derived from the stories that we tell ourselves that we believe to be the truth. So without so much of that idea of ourselves, what we're left with is just the rawness of reality here and now, which is oftentimes a, a incredibly beautiful thing without so much of a story, without so much of a narrative. So I'm curious with from coming at that from my understanding of the psilocybin and do you know what the impact from the Amanita muscaria and is in terms of how you had your experience where you were going through bouts of anxiety, lots of anxiety and, and those types of feelings, and then you weren't so much anymore. Was it a cessation of the story that you were telling yourself or did you see it as a different sort of impact or how does the Amanita muscaria, does it have an impact on the default mode network that you know of, like your, your idea of yourself, or is it a different sort of impact? <laughs> this mushroom is the self mushroom. So this mushroom, I theorize, works on trauma from pre-birth to age six. And in my experience, past life. And I don't say that I believe in past lives or karma. And most of the time I don't, except that I continually experience that with this mushroom. This mushroom is the ego mushroom. It is the be a human mushroom. It deals with your life here on earth and wants you to have a human experience in a healthy way. Whereas psilocybin is going to deal with your relationships with others, other living things, how the trees are sentient, the wind is sentient, and if you take enough, the off-planet beings and entities that you see, right? But the Amanita is about yourself. So let's say I lose my best friend. We've been best friends for 20 years. And she gets into a relationship. And then all of a sudden, we're fighting all the time. And she says, well, we're done. And then I'm devastated. So the first thing that I would do is take Amanita. And Amanita would help me deal with the grieving and the loss. It's a heart-centered mushroom. It helps you focus on your heart and on grieving and on sadness. It has muscarine in it. We have muscarinic receptors in our heart. And it helps you reconcile your sense of self and that you are stable and you're okay. And you need to grieve and own that. And that's part of the beauty of the human experience. And then you take it to the psilocybin. And then on psilocybin, you learn about your relationship to this person, the forgiveness, the understanding of why they're doing what they're doing, the ability to let them go, the karma maybe that you had in it, or the things you needed to work out with that person. And then you come back to the self again, you can take Amanita again and deepen that understanding with the self, the scars that are left behind, the parts of you that, that needed a friendship maybe five years after you knew it was probably over but you hung on. Why did you hang on? And then it deepens your ego. And it is my opinion, this is from the Amanita that I've learned this. The ego is not what's bad. Ego is the vehicle through which you be a human. You get the meat sack to be physical and play in gravity, 
the ego is that package through which you get to have the motivation and, and those goals and the feelings associated with it. The mind then is the story. The ego is not good or bad. So people that are not doing the right work, not getting the therapy, they're going to make crappy decisions. They would use Amanita then and get even more narcissistic. And it can be dangerous that way. The people that are not narcissistically inclined, that have been beaten up by life, that have had their sense of self shrink to the point where they're planning to leave the planet. Like when you withdraw, that's your ego getting smaller to the point where you're so withdrawn you don't even identify with wanting to be on the planet anymore. And it is my theory that that's what aging is. And if you age beautifully and gracefully, you finally come home to the self so that you are so detached from being here that as you age beautifully, you love it here. And at the same time, equally, you're cool with going when it's time to go. And that ego, the when you take Amanita, it helps you own your, your body your human experience and you stand up and you say, oh yeah, I got shit to do. I want to play. And then you can feel your energy get bigger and you occupy the space that you're supposed to occupy beautifully. And then that motivation, that drive to go play in it, to write a book, to travel, to be a better human, to laugh, that, that drive, Amanita just gives you drive. So it is the self mushroom, but you've got to balance that with psilocybin, which is the awareness of others and other experiences and how you are completely connected to other. And then the DMT experience, which is intergalactic. So it's like from the self of the Amanita to the interconnectedness of the earth and the off planet beings of the psilocybin, to the DMT intergalactic universal. Is this all a game? <laughs> Who's the architect? <laughs> Is this a karmic prison? You know, so it's like from the big to the, to the, to the self. That's really interesting. It kind of leads me back to the question that I was, I was attempting to ask earlier, which would be uh, regarding the subjective experience, because I'm always hesitant towards as ascribing any particular purpose to any particular entity or, or, or substance whatsoever, because it really is what we do with it. And when it comes to the subjective experience of, of quote unquote, getting high or tripping out or anything like that, it really is the subjective spectrum of, of how relaxed we are. The more relaxed we are, the more we go to that higher and higher place, which people often as associate with like DMT, but isn't necessary by, by any means. And so you were mentioning that, you know, uh, Amanita tends to draw you back to the here and now I've always found that that psilocybin does the exact same thing, depending again on what you're doing with it. Um, but that with psilocybin, it does tend to lead more towards the continue to relax past that continue to relax past, you know, even your assumptions of what here and now is, which is why I've never had the experience that, um, psilocybin ever taught me anything about others. I always found it always taught me that there are no others that, that there is in fact, just, just me here now. Right. And, and, and that, helps me to empathize with others just because I recognize that we're one and the same. So I guess my question is back to Amanita. Do you find that it's more of just the cessation of overthinking rather than the stimulation of new and insightful thoughts? Do you find it's just bringing you a little bit easier into the present? So you're, there's not as much tendency to reach for a story or, or is it very much dependent on what you want to make it because you were mentioning that for you it immediately brings you back to like one to six years old well i imagine that's a part of your work individually i don't know if necessarily that would have the same impact on me so i've been doing this for five years and this is not just me saying like this is how it affects me but the accumulation of being amnita dreamer i guess and then all of the people that write to me and tell me their experiences and what happened with them. And when I first started, the few people that sort of showed up and said, oh my God, yes, I love this mushroom. And we would talk about it. What are you getting? What are you getting? So this is sort of like me being an anecdotal reporting person of like other experiences or whatever. And it does affect people differently like any entheogen would and differently based on whether you take it during the day, at night, your body chemistry, all this stuff. There are, though, themes 
that tend to go along with it. And you talked about time. Instead of bringing you to the now, it takes you out of time and shows you the multiples of time. So this is the time mushroom, which is why Alice in Wonderland and there's the rabbit, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. And he never gets where he's going. And time is always the theme associated with this mushroom. It's pretty common on Amanita to see yourself split out and experiencing time, multiple versions of you, hundreds, thousands, infinite versions of you experiencing that moment simultaneously, but making different choices. And you can see yourself and then it'll collapse back in on itself. Um, the bilocation of yourself, knowing that you're in different places at the same time, uh, doing things like, uh, and you have to be careful in high enough doses. So you'd be at the top of the steps, but then all of a sudden you're at the bottom. And so you'll plant yourself firmly on the ground thinking you just sort of lost track of, of time, but you didn't, you, you went forward in time where you were at the bottom of the stairs. So you can wind up hurting yourself because you're still at the top of the stairs, <laughs> but you think you're at the bottom. And I tried to cook on it one time, time jumping all over the place, thought it was at the beginning when the pot was still cold and touched it and burned myself because it was later when it was really hot. Um, you'll be walking, heading outside, but then all of a sudden you're back inside looking at the door, trying to go back outside again. So you travel back in time. So it is, it messes with time, but once you use it, then you will have this continue even when you're not on Amanita. And it was one of the first things that showed me about anxiety was being steeped in, in human time with a clock is the source of the bulk of anxiety and that we all have internal time. We are time. Each of us has a different time. We move in time differently. We have a different internal rhythm, different sorts of energies and how we function. Some of us move more slowly. Some of us think more slowly. Some of us with a neuro, neuro, different neurotype, like an ADD neurotype, interact in the world with, with different time that you, know, you can experience time in different ways and can have blanks where you don't track time. And then there's you know autistic time. There are people that just have really high metabolisms and they, they experience time differently. Time, experiencing time is a very unique thing. And you create that time as you move forward in time. And now that I've been taking Amanita for five years, I'm finally living in my own internal rhythm and time. And there was an adjustment period there where I couldn't keep up with, with clock time. So I had to have a lot of scheduling and, you know, different alarms and things to help me until I learned how to make that shift to living on my own time and then interact in the world on, on a clock, on a 24 hour clock. So it's, it was the very first lesson for me about anxiety and learning how to rest and work and slow down and breathe. And then it was compounded on psilocybin this last uh, trip that I took, one of the last things they told me in my my notes to send me home, they were like, just slow down and breathe. Just slow down. And on psilocybin, I did, I get the here and now. It, that's what's so beautiful because you're so steeped in how beautiful everything is. And there's no time. There's just right now. And the Amanita is like, yes, see it? But also there's 15 other times happening or a hundred of them over here and they're all you and they're all happening simultaneously. <laughs> so you can speed up time and you can slow down time. So if you're experiencing something you don't like, you can speed it up. If you're experiencing something you want to really enjoy, you can slow time down. And that's what I've learned to do on Amanita. That's, that's super interesting. Uh, and I enjoying hearing all the perspective from, uh, from the experiences with Amanita muscaria, because again, I, I haven't uh, taken it before. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious as well with, with that, if you see, cause it seems to me just from what I'm garnering. And again, this is just from the conversation that we've had, cause I haven't really looked into them too much outside of this is that there is a element of certainty 
or an element of control that you're seemingly able to maintain on Amanita Muscaria that I think, as you, you've mentioned in previous conversations, there can be repercussions to that. For, for And even in this conversation, you've mentioned how there can be repercussions for, for those who have a stronger idea of themselves that it can then exacerbate that and, and take them to a spot where they can become very narcissistic. They can feel very powerful as in a way you've described it before. It almost reminded me of, of not to compare the two, but like almost like a cocaine type high where you feel like you're still able to maintain a sense of certainty and control. Whereas psilocybin I've always seen in, in my experiences with it, a cessation of that false certainty of that idea of that illusion of control, because through that you can recognize that, okay, I, I never really had control and, and you recognize that you have influence here now though. And so that becomes more your priority is, is where you're at. And on Amanita Muscaria, it seems like there is a ability to maintain a story and through that there is always going to be a potential repercussion. So it's very, very dependent. So it, it it's almost like it makes me hesitant about that, that it could, that someone could maintain such a strong sense of control because oftentimes my perspective on anxiety is that it's the idea that we ever had control that we feel like we're losing it is when anxiety arises as opposed to coming at it almost from the root and recognizing that you never really had control. So when it feels like you're losing it, it's just recognizing, Oh, I've never had it. Oh, I've never known where things are going. Oh, I've never had certainty. Do you see, do you think there could be a potential repercussion to allowing and, and through this specific substance, allowing people to maintain a sort of sense of certainty and, and sense of control with things? Or do you see that as more objectively beneficial to someone? It's going to magnify what you are. So if you are the kind of person who believes that you can control everybody and everything, then when you start taking Amanita in the beginning, in the beginning, it can conflate that, but only temporarily. <laughs> this is the two-sided mushroom, you know, with the, the red and then the white spots, the ibotenic acid that it's got in the beginning, and then you convert it to muscimol. So there's those two medicines. The double-sidedness of this thing is, yes, it gives you a very good sense of self but it's not in the head, it's in the heart. And it lines you up with the largerness of the universe and energy and spirit and the joy of being here through the heart. It has been my experience. You can't think through the lens of control when you're living through the heart. It's a language the heart doesn't speak. So if you want to try to use the medicine and so you keep taking more of it, but you're not doing the work, you're afraid of to feel. And I see this a lot with people that love to trip and leave and love ego death. This will definitely bring you into your shit with no holds barred, like raw, and I've watched a lot of people come out of it very angry and very traumatized because they didn't want to look at that directly into that, right into the trauma and in the heart. I tell people if, if they come to my channel, one of the first things I say is do not do a full muscomol. Don't start there. And don't do a trip. Don't start there. Convert it about 50-50 so that you've got the Loki side, the ibotenic, 
the joyful, the playful, the up, the dance, the energy, the movement side, half converted with the Thor logic, deep work, heart, pain, trauma, down, shadow work side. And in those two, there's so much wisdom in it. And then you start by microdosing. Because if you do that and you work your way up to a macro dose and you spend months with it, you get in the heart space and you start having this time distortion. And the very first thing you learn is a lack of control. <laughs> because when time isn't anymore, there's nothing left to control. Time is the foundation of all of it. And when you truly finally come home to the self and you respect yourself and you love yourself, you automatically know that about the other. This is the boundary mushroom. And as soon as you realize your boundaries, you wouldn't think of crossing them for another. And it creates that respect. So living through the heart, knowing who you are, finally loving it, by proxy, then you don't want to tread on someone else's sovereignty. That's really interesting. I, I'm, I'm very curious about it. I did want to mention to our listener very quickly to um, do your research. Absolutely. Reach out to uh, Amanita if you have any questions, because as with every substance, there are a lot of questions and, and, and considerations. Um, what I thought was really interesting specifically was that Amanita is not regulated in the States. Um, I thought that was really interesting given the warnings and, and some of the, um, the stories that I've been told by a great deal of my native friends over, the, over time, um, just that it is so overlooked. And I, th I think largely because it, it can be so poisonous, it can be so dangerous. So definitely for anybody listening, if you have questions, do your research, do your due diligence for sure. The only state that regulates it is Louisiana, but yeah, it's legal in the United States. I think that it has escaped regulation mostly because it doesn't give you the traditional um, psychedelic experience that the others were known to do back in the 70s when they started all that coming down on everything, on the drug laws and everything. Um, it just wasn't one that was really hailed as the peace, love and understanding, you know, burn your bras and, you know, your draft card kind of thing. Um and again, I come back to the fact that it is not as recreational as it is deeply healing and medicinal. And people can recreate with psilocybin and DMT and all the other things and just truly take it and just have a blast outside of the healing work with it and outside of, you know, the, the whole nature of reality stuff. You can just have a blast on it. You can with Amanita, but after you've developed a relationship with it, and but it's not going to give you the same kind of fun, but you can definitely recreate with it. And I do. And especially with my friends that use it a lot, we get together and recreate with it. And it's a much better recreational experience than alcohol and a great night's sleep. And you just feel better the next day. But it's it's a different kind of recreation after you've done that inner healing and that you've come home to the self and you've healed your shame. This is definitely the shame healing mushroom. And the very first thing it brought me front and center with was my shame. And it hammered that whole shame thing with me for years before I finally took it to the psilocybin and these entity machine elf assholes in an alley sort of held me down and stole shit out of my brain and my heart and it was a pretty crappy experience, but finally in integration therapy, I realized once the Amanita healed the shame, it was rotting inside of me and just sitting there putrid and the psilocybin yanked it all away. And I'm not saying I don't have any left, but it doesn't cripple me anymore. And once you can deal with your shame and come home to yourself and love yourself, you can recreate with it all you want and there's nothing to fear from it anymore. Now, that actually leads me to another question, because as, as you were saying, it's not the same as, as psilocybin. Um, I, I know that uh, Amanita or, or Muscomol has been used to treat epilepsy and Parkinson's um, with some degree of efficacy. Do, do you know if it's been used to the same capacity in terms of treating addiction or, or, or treating uh, childhood trauma, that kind of thing, from the same uh, standpoint? I don't know about any of the research on that. And I know psilocybin is being heavily looked into 
in, in that regard. And I was just wondering if there's any research you could share with us that you might be aware of. There are no clinical trials for Amanita. There are no oral uh, drug studies with Amanita in humans. There's one oral rat study. That's it. This one single one's never been repeated. There's no official use of Amanita to treat anything. And when I first started my channel about four and a half years ago, nobody was even talking about the mushroom. There's nothing about this mushroom. It's because of my advocacy and, and doing what I'm doing and talking directly to research and scientists, asking for the research, saying, this is what I'm seeing anecdotally. This is what, how I'm working with people. This is the feedback I'm getting. Please do research on this. That my hope is eventually, yes. I'm trying to start a page on my website of just practitioners. So people that want help to trip, to heal, to use this at high doses can find someone to do that with. And to find a therapist that does integration therapy with this mushroom, I have one, just one person that, that you can do integration therapy with. I have one shaman out in San Francisco that helps people with high dose experiences. Like, And this is after like almost five years of doing this. So my answer to your question is no. However, anecdotally in my community, what I hear, what we're doing, and I make smoke blends to help. Uh, with a lot of dopaminergic addictions, you know, alcohol, cigarettes, opiates, that kind of thing. I, and sometimes coffee, but like, I don't think coffee's a bad thing. But anyway, that's that's what people are working with this mushroom on those kinds of dependencies and addictions. But also coming off cannabis, because the things that they were using cannabis to treat, Amanita seems to also do just as well without dulling the sleep experience. It's the sleep. It is the sleep mushroom. Like it will, it will make your dreams come alive. It does the bulk of its work in those theta and waking sort of REM areas. So it's sort of the antithesis to cannabis, but there are gating issues that I don't understand yet. I have a theory. I've been looking at the glutamate pathways and glutamate channels. And I think I found where I think the gating issue is. So if you use cannabis a lot, you won't feel anything from Amanita. There's something in the endocannabinoid system there that I believe the cannabinoids are locking into that are blocking the actions of ibotenic acid and muscimol. And then there's issues when it crosses the blood brain barrier. And I think that potentially mannitol um, that's in Amanita is doing something there in the blood brain barrier where it opens that gate, that it there may be something in cannabis that's blocking that receptor that's not allowing it to cross the blood brain barrier so that you may not get the the body high but people report still seeing these differences in time still feeling a strong sense of self still dealing with shame and it seems like they're getting that 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 motivation and that and the strength and the things that people report from Amanita even though they're not feeling it at all they're saying I got nothing I got nothing and yet they're reporting two or three weeks out, how different they feel. And then they tend to be motivated to get off cannabis, which can be pretty difficult. But a lot of people that when they get off cannabis, wind up replacing it with Amanita. And now I forgot the question you asked. I I, I think you pretty much Did covered it? unless... Yeah, unless, oh, unless Ray. Oh, yeah. Nervous system disorders, pain. So like, I believe that it's healing. Oh, I know it's healing. Um, a lot of my pain pathways that the benzodiazepines damaged, although, caveat, I can't separate it from lion's mane. Very shortly after I got off of the benzos, I learned about lion's mane and I was concerned about the dementia. So I took really high doses of lion's mane for about nine months and then, you know, gave my liver a break or whatever. Um, and I've, it has given me my brain back, but I also see ibotenic acid used topically. I started pulling out uh, doing like an oil extraction and putting it on nerve pain. And within 20 minutes, it's gone. And there is a study done by Psyched Wellness. It's a, a, a corporation that's in, was one of the first to make like an official product. And then they did a drug trial on their patented version of muscimol that they call uh, like it's trademarked. And then they, they did a clinical trial in India, which showed that it was generally safe for human consumption. So they got the FDA to at least give it that designation, but it's only their patented thing, not the mushroom, but that it improved uh, stress and sleep 
which is the only claim they can make. They can make it, but I can't make it. So that's the only sort of human clinical thing going on with it. But I was talking to them. I was I did an interview with their chief scientist and, and the CEO, and I was telling them what I was finding with the oil extractions. And that's like my biggest seller. It, it's just every time I make it, it sells out within 24 to 48 hours. It is so incredibly effective topically for pain. I mean, even when Kratom doesn't work and, you know, people don't want to use opiates or they're getting harder to get. But even when opiates aren't working, this is working topically. I have found that it's healing something. It's healing those pathways. And when I was speaking to their their scientists, they were saying they think that it um, is working through the ACE receptors, the ACE2 receptors, and it's reducing inflammation. But I, in addition to reducing inflammation, though, it's much more than that. There is there's healing happening with it that I don't know yet how to talk about or discuss or, or speak to intelligently. Yeah. You and me both for sure. I just wanted to, to weigh in on this one more thing very quickly. And then I'm going to pass it over to Andrew. I think when it comes to all things drug related, um, we start getting into a very interesting area of the conversation because the subjective experience means so much and that's largely driven by our own growth it's driven by our own willingness it's willing driven by our own courage and, and so with different hallucinogen uh, sorry so with different hallucinogens it's not always just the entity itself or it's not always the substance itself so much as what we're willing to do with it and, and so i guess my question in, in terms of, of amanita is, is We've said a few times that, you know, it's the mushroom for the self, or it's the mushroom for boundaries, it's the mushroom for time. Um, I have found that all of those insights are, are always, they're, they're just right there so much as not, they're not simple to look at because we get distracted very easily. So my question is, as you mentioned, not everybody's gonna have the same reaction to this. Some people may get uh, a really sol solid sense of self that isn't necessarily healthy and, and so there's almost an arrogance to it or a control to it and, and you said that can pass as well i guess my question amanita is for you specifically how much do you think it was the mushroom and how much do you think it was your willingness and the fact that you were ready to do something with it because here you are whether you're you're under the influence at all and you're enthusiastic it means something to you but it means something to you based on the change that you've experienced in yourself it's not simply about the mushroom doing the work because as you said everybody else has to do the work as well um so i just wanted to throw that out there very quickly like do you think that there's a good portion that the mushroom can do for you but that without your own work in those trips even outside of those trips it's not necessarily going to do that for me personally i didn't have a sense of self i grew up in so much toxicity and narcissism that my sense of self was forced out of me at an extremely young age. And all I knew was to live for others and to be selfless and that your good was in your value was in how you could tolerate pain and tolerate people and love people, no matter what they were doing or what they did, because you should love them and they're trying their best and how much you could give and serve. So it's no wonder then by the time, you know, I'm sitting out there <laughs> wanting to leave the planet, I think that, you know, the benzos just accelerated that. But then also being autistic, I remember being really young and having a very good, strong sense of self, like, you know, we all are born with. And I I know how it was beat out of me. You know, I was just shamed into non-existence as a neurodiverse person on top of just, you know, the toxicity. When I say this mushroom gave me my sense of self back, it took away all of the, all of the everything, the programming for my whole life. And then reminded me of that little three-year-old squatted down looking at the ants and thinking that that's all there was in the world was the beauty of these ants in this moment. And the only beauty in the world, the only thing that exists in the world was the, the beauty of running and the wind in my hair and being willing to look at any adult and tell them how beautiful my shoes are and just think that they should, they should also think they're beautiful shoes. And I remember that. And this mushroom had to transport me back to her and say, that's who you are. 
and you need to stand up and be proud again like she was. But it's still taking me years to embody that. And it's always that that mushing voice and remembering to get back in my heart and hold my shoulders up and stand in my spot and broaden my sense of self and breathe it in and remember you can move forward here like that. You're okay. You're not arrogant and egotistical just because you're sure of yourself in this moment. It's not arrogant to write a book. You have something to say. If people want to buy it, cool. It's a win-win. And I still struggle with it, but it's a good question. I see what you're getting at. Was it not in me to begin with? It didn't put something in me. It was always there. It got beat up through life. It's a conversation. It took us both and all the elders of the mushroom and all of its ancestors and all of my ancestors. It's a very, very loud conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm so with that and, and going back to, you know, three year old Amanita looking at the ants, I would I, I see children, especially that young, that that sense of self isn't so much a, a sense, it's just a lack of any idea of yourself. And so, you know, when you say things like loving yourself, knowing who you are, things like that, especially knowing who you are, I think a lot of people especially in our society, it's pushed that, you know, you should know yourself. You got to know yourself. If you don't know yourself, then you know, any you're, you're just sitting in uncertainty. But I would argue that that's the reality of, of each and every moment that we never can really know ourselves because any idea of ourself that we settle upon, it's just an idea. It's not the reality of what we are here and now. And so you going back to your three-year-old self and having that sense of self wasn't so much an idea but just your reality here now and that experience without so much of an idea so how do you find balancing do you see a benefit in maintaining an idea of yourself or do you think what a lot of this comes down to is the cessation of needing to feel like you have to maintain an idea of yourself positive or negative and just being where you're at, because that's where I see the freedom that children experience is through a lack of, you know, what this means about me. It's just, it doesn't mean anything about you because any idea you settle upon isn't the reality of you. So I don't have to maintain that so much. And that's where freedom is found. So where, how, how have you found finding that sort of, I guess, balance between your idea of Amanita and recognizing that that's never really the reality of you? here now because it is just an idea my idea of self now finally and looking back on on little her is experiences and when i was three and four years old i always dreamed of traveling and all of the places that i would go and the things that i would experience i lived in the future as much as the the present you know being just blown away by the now but also aware that I had a body and it was so cool. It just so fascinated with my hands. So fascinated with how fast I could run. So fascinated with how loud I could bang a spoon on a pot and just how loud the sound could get. And I was doing that, you know, and experimenting with the boundaries of this tiny little body and, and what can it do? But then also what's it gonna do? And then the me now experiencing entheogens, healing, out and in and out of time, um, leaving the planet, going, you know, this last experience, I did 10 grams and, you know, left the construct, went to the void. In other trips, I've been to the Intergalactic Council or met the architect or whatever. And I have like some favorite off-planet beings. And the thing that I keep coming back to today is that it's about experience. It's not about time because you can only be here now or multiple nows. <laughs> and it's not about the story that you're telling yourself because that's just a story that you're telling yourself, which you can just change. It's about experience. And I want to experience duality, 
gravity, emotion, cheesecake, tripping, conversation, travel. And I want to do it through these eyes while I can, because once it's dissolved and goes back to wherever it is or ceases to exist, that's the end of this experiencing. And what this has done now for me is I realize just how beautiful it is to be here and also how very limited the time is to be here and to experience. For me, for this particular package that I'm in, it's about experience. I choose to self-ness myself because I'm not afraid of it anymore. I'm not afraid to say I am me in a body experiencing separately from all of you. It has a name. It has its own trajectory. It has its own experience. And it is now breathing and experiencing through its own eyes. And I love that idea, which makes me think I came here just to do that shit. And I finally rid of the bullshit so I can do that and play in the space-time continuum for a while. But also because I've been so busy surviving, I haven't had the luxury of really sitting back and living through the heart and enjoying other people's experiences through their eyes. And that's been one of the most beautiful things that entheogens have given me is listening to other people's trip stories other people's stories of healing, watching people's Instagram posts, videos, their takes on the world, the way they see the world. They're walking through a park and just saying, hey, and then they just drop some bomb of wisdom. And I'm like, wow, that was a beautiful way to see that moment and express that, that only that human in that meat sack could in that moment in time. I get that we're all connected. I feel that. I go through that. I love that. But Amanita Dreamer's experience, at least currently, is just enjoying my separateness experiences through this meat sack, maybe because I haven't been able to most of my life. I don't know. That's beautiful. And I just wanted to add something very quickly. Um, the experience of, of just wanting it to end and deciding that it's going to and carrying that all the way out to, to the end of the journey. I've been there myself. And that's when I faced my own death and the recognition that there's got to be something I can do with all this shit, right? As long as it doesn't define me. And I didn't understand that. But that feeling of suddenly being able to put down the narrative that is the conflict, that is the weight, that is the reason that we keep butting up against everything. It changes our experience of this reality. It changes our experience of ourself and that all of a sudden it's a choice again. It's not that we're stuck here. It's not that we're trapped here. It's not that we're forced to be here, but it's a choice what we do with it each and every moment, whether or not we want to pick up the weight or not. And if we do, that's fine, but we don't have to. And so it changes. And I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the story that you've shared with us, the experience that you've had. And I look forward to seeing all of the different mentalities that you continue to explore and that you continue to find now that you are free to explore everything that you are and everything that you might be. Um, I just wanted to say, I appreciate you sharing this with us and our audience. I know everybody's going to enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I look forward to having you back at some point, Amanita. I'm gonna stop talking now and pass it to Andrew, but I just wanted to express very quickly that I'm very excited that you're here in the world with us, creating ripples. You know, I often look at it as um, I'm just me and obviously you're just you, but because we're so vast, there is no we. Right. It's just one immense, limitless being. I'm excited to be part of the journey and whatever ripples that we are creating on this planet. I'm excited to I'm excited to see where they go as well, because just like yeah, because just like psilocybin mushrooms, it's been a long journey to even getting to the point where there's companies now that are doing research. Cannabis, same thing. It's been a long journey, even getting to the point where we can have the conversation. So this is another conversation. I look forward to seeing it expand and seeing what Amanita Muscaria can do for humanity again. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I appreciate your, uh, your willingness and I resonate with it a lot, um, to explore these and, and be open about them and be willing to have the conversation, the conversation that's been suppressed for, you know, we didn't get into it so much today, but I, I think we all know the, uh, the suppression of them and how 
absurd with with all of these substances that come from the earth it has it has become it it doesn't make any sense but at the same time given you know our current societal mentality the system that we're all a part of it it kind of does make sense the the pharmaceutical industries that they rely upon you know the the benzo and and all of the drugs and and the recurring use of them and and whatnot we didn't so much get into that today maybe in our next conversation but anyway i appreciate your willingness to put yourself out there explore these things talk openly about them in a space that still has so much so much stigma that i think is uh yeah far too harsh and uh undeserving relative to everything else that's that's going on around there so i appreciate you coming on with us and and chatting with us um i know you have a website and a YouTube channel. Um, feel free to share that again, just to reiterate to everyone listening, like definitely do your research with, as we say, whenever we talk about these substances, do your research. Uh, Amanita knows a lot about these substances. So it's beautiful that we have her as a resource that you can, you can check out if you are interested in checking them out. But yeah, Amanita, um, thank you again, but feel free to share uh, where people can find you at. Actually, I do want to add one more thing because I know it likely made her a little bit uncomfortable because she is not a medical professional or offering any type of medical advice. We do want to make that very clear that because of the nature of the substance and this conversation, it really is on you. Do your due diligence. Be responsible. Do all of that. But if you are responsible and you do want to do that, that due diligence, there is somebody here who has the same enthusiasm. And I know she would love to chat with you about it. Thank you. Yes. I do not do one-on-one -on -one consultations because I'm not a medical professional or a mental health counselor or therapist or professional. I am a researcher who then has a big mouth <laughs> just got on the internet with it. So I create the repository of what I've learned and what I'm doing. My healing journey is out there for everyone to see. I trip on camera. I cry on camera. I heal on camera so that you can feel safe to do it too. And that's what AmanitaDreamer.net is. My YouTube channel is Amanita Dreamer, and MushroomVoice.com is my community and my store. Thank you so much, Amanita. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us throughout this episode. It's been intensely interesting. I do look forward to having Amanita come and join us for a group one of these days where maybe we can have people ask her some uh, some Q&A and, and put some of those answers out into the community just so people have a little bit more in terms of uh, research or, or a, a bit more in terms of an opportunity to discuss. Again, not medical professional advice by any means, but an open dialogue. So Amanita, thank you so much. For being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. This was fun. Bye, everyone.